Evening. My name is Darren Macy and I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the first of Flavio's Spring Seas on Heritage, Landscape and Tourism. There'll be three events spread over uh, March and April and tonight's first event is Curious Travellers Now and Then. Uh, first piece of housekeeping, you're welcome to keep your cameras on but please turn your mics off until the end until we, we have a, a question and answer session. Our series opens tonight with an exploration of how Welsh communities have visited by people from across the country and further afield since the 18th century. Uh, through the lens of travel, we can, we can further uncover the ways of Welsh landscape has been transformed as a industrialization and how continuing curiosity is translated in our current heritage projects that shine an important light on Welsh histories. Our guest speakers tonight will be Rita Singer, Nathan Abrams, Catherine Stevens, who will take us on a journey through the subject of heritage, landscape and tourism. Our chair tonight is the wonderful Marion Gwynn, Marion is a heritage consultant specialist in Atlantic slavery and empire. Marion's work challenges traditional uh, conceptions of history of country houses and museums, and she advises risk house recovery on issues of heritage diversity and works with private and public organizations across the country, helping them develop more inclusive ways of working. Over to you, Marion. Oh, thank you very much, Darren, and welcome to everybody, has, as Dan has said. Now, we're going to have three wonderful speakers. Um, Dan's already um, mentioned them. If you could use the chat facility, please, to, to raise any questions and we'll be, or any comments on any of the issues, and we'll be having a question and answer session and discussion session after our three speakers have spoken. And I'm delighted that we begin our online spring series of 2022 with an exploration of how Welsh communities have been visited or viewed by people of different cultures and periods from the 18th century to the present day. Now, how Wales is seen has preoccupied our thinking for generations, and we all respond to the landscapes we live in or visit in different and individual ways. And our three speakers tonight explore the experiences and responses of different publics to Wales or parts of it through historical journals, heritage apps, or real-time responses while walking. Now, I'm sure that their very different take on the theme of heritage, landscape, and tourism will reveal very complex but fascinating appreciations of the Welsh landscape that will shine a light on dynamic and, um, and socioeconomic identities and cultural experiences of visitors to or residents of Wales. And so a brief introduction to our three speakers tonight. I'm delighted to welcome Rita Singer, Nathan Abrams and Katrin Stevens. Dr. Rita Singer is an experienced researcher and project officer with a particular interest in historical fiction. Ideas of space and place in fictional and non-fictional writings in Wales, heritage tourism, maritime history and cultural geography. And since 2013, she has worked on a number of projects, and these include Ports Past and Present with Aberystwyth University, U-Boats Project 1814 to 1818, commemorating the war at sea, and that is of course with the Royal Commission. And then Journey to the Past, Wales and Historic Travel Writing from France and Germany with Bangor University and European Travellers to Wales, um, 1750 to 2010, and that again is with Bangor University. And Rita's talk tonight will focus on visits to landed estates and their surrounding areas, including sites of industry, focusing on the emergence of these locations um, as tourism spots from as early as 200 years ago, establishing a formula, and I'm very much looking forward to this, still evident in modern tourism today. And Professor Nathan Abrams. Now, I was working today, Nathan, at Llandidno Museum, and they were talking a lot about the work that you have done, that they have done with you on on this theme now nathan as we as we all know is a professor of film at bangor university and he has been exploring the jewish history of north wales since his arrival in the area in 2006. he leads various cultural walks exploring this heritage and has helped to create maps and an app of this history under the title walking jewish history this initially covered bangor but now covers other areas, including Llandidno and Anglesey. And then we have Catherine Stevens. Catherine is the former head of History and Humanities at Trinity College, Carmarthen. She's the former chair of Archiv um, Menwad Cymru, uh, Women's Welsh Archives, and um, Mentor Ysgolion uh, Tartadau Cymraeg. 
um, Welsh Heritage Schools initiative. She's the author of many books for children on Welsh history, as well as books and articles for adults on folk tradition and women's history, notably Voices from the Factory Floor 2017 and Hannes Menwad Cymru. Um, published in 2019, which she based mainly upon oral histories. And Catherine will be speaking to us tonight about her work with Archid Menwad Cymru and the walking tours that they have developed. And so it is my pleasure now to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Rita Singer. Rita, over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Marianne, for this very, very lovely introduction. Um, let's do the obligatory Let's see if my screen works. And we're off. If I'm going to dive into my selection of historical travel accounts by European visitors and their positions of Wales, allow me to take you to a small detour to the European Travelers Project, which laid the foundations for today's topic. Professors Catherine Jones, Carol Talley, and Heather Williams and I investigated the developments of travel writing about Wales by visitors from continental Europe since the mid 18th century. We identified over 450 texts, the majority of them written in French or German. The great variety of genres we found show that European travelers came to Wales, not just for a jolly, but from the very start for professional purposes, reasons of health to settle down or as refugees. Among the group of early travellers is the Breton exiled naval officer Amon Louis Bomodet, Comte de Penouet, and his guidebook Letters describing a tour through part of South Wales from 1797 contains descriptions of early established tourist attractions such as Tintin Abbey, the then newly built bridge at Pont de Prive, or a visit to Margam Estate. Most interestingly, Penouet's landscape descriptions, his illustrations, and lines from French royalist poetry betray his strong anti-revolutionary proclivities. The descriptions of his encounter with the indigents of Neath Abbey is perhaps the most striking example in his entire account. The cells of Neath Abbey serve as a retreat to an innumerable gang of mendicants whose figures are hideous beyond all that can be imagined. As soon as I entered into one of the vaulted outer parts, several women surrounded me, and the further I advanced, the more the troop augmented. They carried almost all of them infants on their backs and the tone of voice in which they begged of us could be compared only to that of those women who headed the rebels at Paris. Penouet's resentment against the lower orders could not be more obvious. The demanding clamor of the beggar women reminds him of the Parisian women's march on Versailles, which in hindsight came to symbolize the beginning breakdown of the Ancien Regime. As an exiled royalist, Penouet has no sympathy for the mothers and the children but presents the poverty as an insult to his noble birth and presumed natural station in life, which had been taken from him by similarly situated women in his native France. Not only were travel routes determined by visitors seeking Welsh landscape, ancient ruins and culture, but industrial espionage was also, also played its part since the 18th and 19th centuries. Specific sites of interest to European visitors included the world's largest ironworks in Mother Tidville, and Thomas Telford's suspension bridges across the River Conwy and the Menai Strait. Written during his years of exile in Britain in the 1850s, Johann Heinrich Betzi's descriptions of hellfire furnaces illuminating the Welsh valleys at night reflect German enthusiasm for the sublime spectacle of industrial production. The further we travel through horrific mountains of slag, he writes, more and more gleaming throats of furnaces escaped like volcanoes endlessly spewing fire and flame with demonic passion. In contrast to the terrifying aspect of the coal and ironworking districts of the south, Telfus bridges, bridges present an unprecedented lightness of steel chains and beams, and European travelers praise them as tokens of modernity and enterprise to which the countries of mainland Europe should aspire. Shortly after opening the Menai Suspension Bridge, Basile Joseph Ducot from France imagined how, in this vast seascape, a great path can be made out through the clouds. Stretched across the sky, it seems to be held only by light ropes, as it spans a gap of about 12 feet. His compatriot, Pierre Etienne Denis Saint Germain Le Duc, wrote in 1837 It looks for all the world like the trace of some marvelous jewel that was tossed into the air by a fairy. 
men busy painting the chains struck me as large flies. Aside from using travel accounts to express their political proclivities or comment on modern industry and architecture, a majority of travel accounts do reflect a more leisurely interest. For example, traveling through Britain at the tail end of the Romantic period, Prince Hermann von Pöckler Moscow officially visited out of a general interest in land and people. Unofficially, though, he spent the years 1828 to 1829 scouting out country and society for a wife. Remodeling his home in vast parklands in the Kingdom of Saxony, he had run into financial difficulties. He and his wife Lucy therefore amicably dissolved their marriage, but not their personal relationship, with the intention that a rich British heiress would refill the prince's deflated purse. No eligible lady materialized during those two years in Britain, and instead, Pricla Muscow's gossipy travelogue became one of the bestsellers of his day. Some of the popularity was no doubt owed to the often catty character sketches and his cutting remarks on British politics. However, while Pricla Muscow's observations show his long standing familiarity with Britain in general, there's also an observable qualitative difference in his descriptions of Wales. Like the majority of accounts at the time, Pricla Muscow's description of his Welsh surroundings are meticulous but distorted by an Anglo-centric point of view that is further colored by his own class and gender. Among Pickler Muscow's key destination in North Wales was the Penryn estate owned by George Hay Dawkins Pennant, including the castle, surrounding parks and the nearby quarries, which he identified as the main source of income. The Penryn sugar plantations in Jamaica with their over 700 slaves go unmentioned. This is not necessarily born out of embarrassment on Pickler Muscow's side, but much rather his ignorance of their existence. 10 years later, on a journey through Egypt, he would buy Belili, a 12 year old girl on the slave market in Cairo and kept her as his mistress, now renamed to Mahuba at his castle in Saxony where she died two years later. Despite the lack of linking the Penryn's family's wealth with their colonial enterprise, Pukla Muscow's description of the castle is particularly interesting as he visited during the phase of extensive redevelopment of the original structure into the building that we know today. The pure Saxon style, he writes, is preserved in the minutest details, even in the servants' rooms and meanest parts of the building. In the eating hall, I found an imitation of the castle of William the Conqueror at Rochester. What could then be accomplished only by a mighty monarch is now executed as a plaything only with increased size, magnificence and expense by a simple country gentleman whose father very likely sold Jesus. Exploring the castle, the prince also talked to the architect, Thomas Hopper, who allowed him to inspect the construction plans. Pukla Muscow, sharing the simple countryman's building passion, clearly admires the ability of the comparatively nouveau riche, Lord Penryn, to envision such a fairy castle and afford to realize his dream. At the time of Pukla Muscow's journey, Britain's level of industrial production was several decades ahead of continental Europe, and for that reason, foreign curiosity, if not outright espionage, around British industrial sites was rife. And since Germans love a good piece of engineering, it is no surprise that many of their accounts contain descriptions of modern bridges or viaducts, as well as industrial machinery. Particularly the new railway systems and their many uses are prominent in German accounts including Pickler Muscow's description of Penryn Quarry and the small railway system used for transporting the slates or adventurous visitors. I was obliged to lie down in one of the little iron wagons which serve for the conveyance of the slates and are drawn by means of a windlass through a gallery hewn into the solid rock at pitch dark. It is a most disagreeable sensation to be dragged through this narrow passage at full speed and in Egyptian darkness after having had ample opportunity of seeing at the entrance the thousand abrupt jagged projections by which one is surrounded. It is impossible to get rid of the idea that if one came in contact with any of these salient points, one would, in all probability, make one's egress without a head. These days, Penner and Quarry is no longer a site of slave production, but it still offers tourists death-defying experiences as they hurtle over the gaping quarry ravine along the fastest zip wire of the Northern Hemisphere. Counteract acting such adrenaline packed activities, visitors may also gain an insight into the slate mining heritage of North Wales. This heritage, as we know, was recognized by UNESCO for inclusion in the World Heritage List last summer, based on the unique combination of historically innovative production methods 
the international reach of the mined product, as well as the culturally transformative influence across North Wales. Unlike Pökemuska, however, the UNESCO listing does recognize that just like the castle, much of the capital used in establishing the quarry had originated in Jamaica. Although Pöklomuskal's journey was undertaken out of financial necessity, his travel account clearly shows him as a privileged traveler at ease with her surroundings from a long-standing familiarity with wider British culture. In contra contrast, Malvida von Meisenbuch's autobiography shows a more ambivalent traveler, not so much out of choice, but necessity. At the time of her visit to the Anglesey estate Lingarth, she lived in exile in London, owing to her socialist activities and her championship of women's education. So clearly that made her dangerous. It is thanks to her work as children's educator that she received an invitation to Klingarth in 1852. Situated on the Menai, the mansion originated as a cottage before it was bought in the early 1840s by Silas Schwager, a German immigrant and factory owner in Manchester, and his wife Julia, a noted school founder and philanthropist. The Schwabers were well connected among noted writers, social reformers, composers, politicians, and educationalists of their day. Although mostly resident in Manchester, the family frequently retreated to their Welsh home, where they entertained their renowned guests, such as the writer Elizabeth Gaskell, prison reformer Thomas Wright, or William Amherst, the former Governor General of India. The Schwabers also kept the doors open to overseas visitors, especially to political refugees from the German countries. Meisenburg had, had then been in London just for a short time when Julia Schwab's invitation reached her. For the first time, I found myself in an English household, even though my hosts were of German extraction. Nobody subjects themselves so easily to the habits of a foreign country, adopts their customs and foreign language, and identifies so strongly and thoroughly with the natives, like the Germans do. Almost all German families, especially the wealthier ones who are in England, have organized their lives according to English manners. The so-called natives in Meisenburg's account are English, not Welsh. Her descriptions contain only very few mentions of excursions into the neighboring villages and town. She does recognize the picturesque beauty of Sodonia on one of her rare excursions, and she praises civil engineering projects for their elegance and sites of industrial production for their size. However, these excursions barely register among her descriptions of life at Glyngarth, and it quickly becomes apparent that despite its name, Glyngarth effectively represents a little England beyond Wales. Towards the end of the century, and located much further to the south, another successful immigrant established her stately home in Wales. In 1878, opera singer Alina Patti was searching for a permanent home and found it in Kraigenos Castle near Strakan Lice. Like the Schwabes on Anglesey, Patti too held court. But instead of drawing intellectuals and politicians, she was a patron of the performing arts and her philanthropic activities linked Patti closely with her Welsh neighborhood. One of her long-standing friends of the classical music, music scene was the German musician, composer and conductor Wilhelm Ganz, who was one of the leading conductors in Britain at the time. In his autobiography, he, he recounts many visits to Craig and Noss and its surroundings. Gantz's memory of his first visit are emblematic for Patty's involvement with local causes through the decades. She first invited me to assist at a charity concert which she gave for the Swansea Hospital in the 80s. The distance from her home was about 20 miles by rail and all along the embankments, crowds of miners stood with their wives and children watching the train go by and cheering her waving their caps and handkerchiefs as she passed along. On her arrival at Swansea, she was received by the mayor and some members of the corporation. The ships in the harbour were decked with flags, and on each side of the way bunting with such mottos as God bless the Queen of Song, welcome and long live Adelina Patti, etc. decorated the route. Anza's account establishes that Patti's popularity in the neighborhood did not singularly originate from her international fame as opera singer, but also from her poor relief activities. It portrays Patti as the benevolent matriarch of her bro, who, in quotes, in winter time provides the poor of the neighborhood with coals and blankets and gives them winter clothes. Gansers is not the only account of Kraigenos and its famous owner. 
the influential music critic Eduard Hanslick from Bohemia received an invitation to the estate in 1886. In contrast to Wilhelm Ganz, Hanslick's view of Patti's household betrays his professional distance. His and his wife Sophie's journey marks them as outsiders who have to go certain lengths to reach their destination somewhere at the edge of civilization. Hanslick's initially positive impression of the increasingly verdant and rural character of Wales comes almost abruptly to a halt once he enters the upper Swansea Valley where, and I quote, the landscape turns more gloomy, monotonous. Not even Patty's transformation of the formerly solid rectangular residential house into a lavishly decorated fairy castle can lift his spirits. When the Hanslicks attempt to escape the stifling and artificial atmosphere of the house and flee into the Welsh countryside, they find their plans foiled by uncooperative landscaping. My wife and I woke up quite early in the hope of going for a fine walk. The surroundings had been praised to heaven in word and print, but we found nothing but a dusty country lane leading right towards Brecon and left towards Swansea. Would it be possible to walk up any of these hills that surrounded the valley? No. There were no trails and barely a path suitable for experienced mountaineering goat herds. Despite Mr. Gantz's informed company, it is entirely impossible for us. We are stuck on the road that has been fenced in with hedges. In contrast to Wilhelm Gantz, Hans Lick, the professional critic, acknowledges that his host, her home, and its surrounding failed his expectations. So we kind of have a Victorian version of Paris syndrome here. For most past and present European travellers, Wales is often a canvas on which they project their own desires, imaginations or identities. Encounters with landed wealth subsequently complicate the picture of a comparatively impoverished country. Prince Hermann from Pupla Moscow was searching for a rich future wife and so his perceptions of eligibility were influenced by ostentatious displays of wealth. Visiting Glengarth, the political refugee Malvida from Meisenburg questioned the social hierarchies of polite English society, even though she effectively spent her entire time with German hosts in Wales. Her account of Wales gives next to no impression of the Welsh population, cultural particularities, or descriptions of her surroundings. This gap is not so much the reflection of an invisible Wales, but much rather owed to a series of factors, such as social norms, Meisenburg's financial dependence on her hosts and the socio-cultural division between an effectively run, English run estate and its Welsh surroundings. Meisenburg had little to say of Wales because she hardly encountered it. The same phenomenon holds true in the counts of Wilhelm Gans and Eduard Hanslick and their respective visits to Kragenos. Whereas the former experienced the castle as his friend's Welsh home base over many years, the latter found an overly dramatic fairy castle situated in a less than exciting landscape. And on a final note, I would want to trace, if you want to trace the footsteps of the European travellers mentioned today, as well as others, allow me to direct you to the website Journey to the Past, that Marianne already mentioned, that we produced in collaboration with the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales. On this website, you can follow nine virtual trails across Wales and experience some of the sites as they would have appeared to our European visitors around 200 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rita. That was, that was a superb overview of what is a very, very complex subject. Thank you very much indeed. And it is wonderful to have that range of perspectives brought um, to the fore as well. I think many of us have heard of some of them, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are a few that people would not be aware of. And as you can see, lots of claps are appearing on, on the screen. As we said before, we will be having um, Q&As and comments afterwards. Do please bring your, your questions in. And it is a pleasure now to introduce Professor Nathan um, Abrahams, um, Abrahams. Nathan, over to you. Thank you very much. Mute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Nathan. Thank you. I just gave my whole presentation. I'm done. 
<laughs> whilst I was on mute. Um, Diochen Varial, Marian, Nosweitar, thank you very much. Um, good evening. Can you all see my PowerPoint? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, um, so I'm going to talk about. Um, I can. There is there is actually a connection between one of um, Rita's slides and something we're working on now. Um, see if Rita can guess it, um, or anyone can guess it in the chat. Uh, um, but that's a forthcoming project that won't um, feature in this quite yet. What I'm going to talk about is. Um, is, is interesting because um, what I've been doing is taking what is this is taking the work of this chap and um, so I arrived in, in Bangor in 2006 immediately discovered that very little had been written about the Jews of North Wales and um, tried to rectify that but I didn't do it on my own um, I won an HRC grant that led um, to a PhD studentship for this chap here, Kai Parry Jones, who wrote a PhD on the subject of the Jews of Wales. And then he uh, subsequently wrote this book on the left, um, which I recommend as the still the only extant book that covers all of the history of the Jews of Wales. But prior to that, it was mainly South Wales. Um, so this is a pan um, historical, um, pan sort of Welsh study. Now, um, I can't. Um, claim credit for having um, done that research. Kai did it under my supervision. But what I've been trying to do is um, popularize it. So to create um, walking trails for visitors to Wales um, to, to use and people in Wales, but also to illustrate um, the history of Jews who have visited and then ultimately stayed in Wales. Um, so there's an interesting um, trajectory there and that many people and I can talk about about this many Jews started off um, as visitors to Wales and then and ended up staying and then and then moving on uh, but and then and then sorry not moving on um, it's interesting and when I was studying Scottish Jewish history which is what I did before um, one of the anecdotes I heard people would ask um, an elderly Scottish Jewish resident what what made you decide to settle in Scotland and the answer would be settle I haven't settled I just haven't moved yet. So um, that could be one explanation for, um, you know, someone like myself, I'm still a traveler, I just haven't moved yet. Um, anyway, so um, we took Kai's work and with funding and partnerships from um, different places uh, like the Khan Didnor, um, like the Bangor Fund, University's Bangor Fund, um, the Economic and Social Research Council, um, we've produced today um, two, two maps we're working on a third and I'll, I'll go through those. Um, so the first one here is uh, covers the history of Bangor. Um, this is Maurice Watsky's first shop. So he's an interesting traveler to Wales. Maurice Watsky came over from um, Turek in modern day Poland. Um, would have landed probably in Hull as most people from um, that part of the world did. Transmigrated across to Liverpool. Um, once in Liverpool, um, decided to pedal in the Welsh countryside, so in a sense fits this bill as a traveller to Wales. And it was whilst he was pedalling in the Welsh countryside, um, and um, as the story goes, actually on, on the Menai Bridge. I love that um, slide that Rita showed. Um, if only it still looked like that. Uh, <laughs> if one goes down there now, it doesn't, well, if one could go down there now, um, not only would your view be blocked by houses, it just doesn't look as nice, even if there's artistic license in that picture. Um, so as Maurice Watsky was peddling on the Menai, uh, or crossing the Menai Bridge as he was peddling um, his clocks and watches, um, he uh, um, was picked up in a carriage and had a very interesting chat with the carriage owner, um, who then gave him a card and said, um, um, well, if you want to shop, I have plenty of shops. Um, do get in touch. And when, when he, he left the carriage and looked at the card, it, it turned out to be the Marcus of Anglesey, who um, leased him his first shop on 21 High Street, and which is the picture up above. For those who know Bangor, that's um, the city dental practice opposite Lidl, um, just near the station. Obviously, the proximity of the station is handy because it's because of the development of um, cheap transportation via steamships from um, Central Europe. Uh, and, and then the railways, once they landed in, in Britain, um, facilitated, uh, 
the, this travel to the UK as part of that great migration um, from Eastern and Central Europe to Western Europe and the United States, of which um, you know uh, uh, um, the Jews were part of that great migration um, on their way westwards. So, so those who ended up in um, Bangor and other well, well, pretty much anywhere actually outside of the major metropolis in the UK um, did so as part of that migration. And the reason why they ended up in the more fun, far flung places is because once they arrived in these major conurbations, there were too many other people like them who did the same thing. So there was uh, a lot, um, too much competition, hence leading them to go off to travel and pedal in the countryside. And um, you can see this in the pattern of settlement across North Wales. There were, there were five communities um, in North Wales. Um, so from east to west, that would be Wrexham, Rill, Colwyn Bay, Clan did not and Bangor, although they were Jews spread out all across, um, all across, well, all across Wales. Um, interestingly, in one of the maps I use, they put a community in Aberystwyth. Uh, I'm not quite sure it's a community in the sense I would define it, i.e., as having a synagogue and a congregation. They might have had a temporary one, um, but 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 that gives an example of where uh, Jews spread out. Anyway, so that's just some of the information we feature in the map. What we did, um, I'll just go back working with this chap here. Um, this chap here on the left, this is Gareth Roberts of Mentor Vachwen, which is a local social enterprise. Um, working with Gareth, we took the history that was in Kai's book um, for starters. We then um, added to that by trawling the Jewish Chronicle, which is the kind of oldest Jewish paper in the world, actually, um, which has a fantastic, fantastic keyword searchable database and supplemented that with research into the local press, both in Welsh and English to um, flesh out the um, rather drier details that the Jewish Chronicle might provide. So the Jewish Chronicle um, as befitting a paper that's um, edited from London and given that the majority of the Jewish community is based in London, still based in London, devotes only, only a few pages to what it might call regional matters. And um, so, you know, it's rather skeletal the information one will gain from there. And what Gareth would, would do is was flesh this out with the much more detailed accounts that one would find in local newspapers. Because in the late 19th century and early 20th century, accounts of Jewish um, ceremonies um, were of particular interest um, as being quite unusual. And we transformed this initially into a walking map. And we, we did actually, we I've um, between us, I think we've done um, in Bangor about four or five walks, um, which have developed every time as we gathered more information. And um, Bangor's only a small place for those of you familiar with it, but you'd be surprised for a place that has almost zero extant Jewish heritage, we're able to stretch out a walking tour um, of, of Lower Bangor um, into a couple of hours and then a separate one in Upper Bangor for another couple of hours. Um, and we hope to repeat those. So we've done this map, here's just a bit of detail um, these are um, available from me, they are free. This is a paper map um, where you just go on a self-guided walk around sites in the, I mean, to do the whole thing with a good couple of hours. Um, one of the reasons it takes that long is um, when you're trying to sh shepherd around a group of 20 people and also Gareth likes to tell stories. Um, so he's often, he often gives more information than we can possibly fit on the map. Now, we were lucky with that funding to then transform the um, Bangor um, portion of the map into this app called Walking Jewish History. I gave it a sufficiently generic title because I thought, well, it's a platform for anybody who wants to put Walking Jewish History, regardless of where they are in the world. We don't want a situation where um, it's called Welsh Jewish History, so therefore we can only put Welsh Jewish History on there. Um, and it's a very handsome app. Um, it's great to show you some. So one of the things that I think is really great about it is it has a before and after feature where it shows you the a site today and then you swipe across and it shows you how it looked um, back in the day. Um, so here's some details. So this is free to download. It's still available um, on both Apple and Android. So I do recommend that. And um, having completed that, that was, uh, we then got further funding. And this is when we um, partnered with Llandidnon Museum. And we then did a map uh, of a similar format 
in um in in, in Khandidna. and actually we've done quite a few walks now I, um, according to my calendar there's one this sunday um, but double check on the website. So my calendar says we're doing a walk about 10 o'clock from outside the museum, um, if anyone's interested. And here's a detail from the paper map that we created. You can see you can see the fold in the middle there um, uh, uh, as an example. Um, now, Khandidna is actually much more interesting in terms of Travellers to Wales to, to fit this into the theme. Uh, just to go with the Wartsky theme, um, I'll talk about the, the, the Travellers in a minute. So. Wartsky's the clock and watch shop started in Bangor and then moved eastwards to Khandidna, where at one point they had three shops. And um, here's, here's one of the pictures from the past. And uh, Wartsky, Morris Wartsky moved to Khandidna. Um, his, he, his daughter Harriet married Emmanuel um, Snowman, who took over as managing director. And Emmanuel Snowman turned Wartsky's into kind of the um, much more famous firm that had royal patronage and had such customers as um, Jackie Onassis, Frank Sinatra and Ian Fleming, who featured um, Emmanuel Snowman in Property of a Lady, which was adapted as Octopussy. Um, but unfortunately, in the adaptation, um, Emmanuel Snowman was written out. Uh, but but he is in the he's there to verify a Fabergé egg because Wartsky's um, had a lot of um, Fabergé stuff um, benefiting from what we can describe as a fire sale in Russia following the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. So anyway, so this is one of the stops on our tour, as is the uh, image I showed you before. Now, but Khandidna is interesting because Khandidna, um well, I mean, it still is a magnet for um, visitors um, from all over the country. Um, but Khandidna um, is unusual as being the only place to maintain a synagogue anywhere in Wales outside of Cardiff. I think there's still a Swan synagogue in Swansea, maybe Newport. Um, but certainly it's the only synagogue that remains in North Wales um, and is unusual. Um, that it A, remains, but B, isn't owned by the local community because there is no local community anymore. Um, it's owned by an outside organisation called Chabad. I should have put a picture in here. Um, and on the, um, I can dig one up, on the um, exterior of the synagogue is a sign saying Chabad Retreat Centre. Um, it's a house that's been, um, so a, a um, so two semi-detached houses that have been um, con you know, not, not through and converted into a synagogue that maintain um, significant space for people to stay in. So, so Khandidna is able to sustain a synagogue because of um, its kind of reputation as the Queen of Welsh Resorts. Um, but similarly, uh, um, that, that's what began the kind of Jewish migration to Khandidna in the first place. And what I've put up here, they're possibly too small to read, so I've got my computer here. Um, are adverts from the Jewish Chronicle advertising Jewish um, boarding houses, kosher boarding houses, um, um, you know, catering to specific Jewish requirements in terms of kashrut, um, you know, food dietary requirements and of Sabbath uh, observation. And um, so you can, hopefully you can read those. Um, um, you can see, um, I'm just trying to look for details here, Orthodox Jewish board establishment, third one down on the left. Um, you can see use of Hebrew at the bottom one on the left, Beit Mazal, which means um, house of luck, um, house of good luck. And um, the middle one on the right, Tikva, means hope. And uh, so you can see there's quite a few establishments um, have have grown up to cater for the trade um, um, for for Jewish travellers to Wales, and that's the interesting thing. I mean, so that's actually been an interesting study to do. I haven't done it. Is to think about those Jewish travellers who came to Wales and went back home, who didn't necessarily stay, although a, a community did grow up in Khan did not, and um, it was quite a big community, quite a substantial community, um, and it was swelled particularly during World War II with evacuees and refugees, if they count as um, travellers to Wales, some of whom only stayed temporarily, including members of my extended family, I discover. So what I've discovered in doing Welsh Jewish history is all roads lead to Llandidna. Um, so so Llandidna still continues to attract 
Jewish visitors today and, and, and people who have been in this area um, are, uh, will be familiar with the um, what we call the Hasidic Jews, uh, um, Jews who wear black hats and have um, side locks by their ears who, uh, who visit Wales. Um, and they're, they're, they're especially distinctive because of their garb. There's different groups that visit, the Chabad I've mentioned, Satmar, um, um, it's another ultra-Orthodox group, and Vishnitz, and they even own properties in Chlandidna. So Chlandidna is still a popular destination for Jewish travellers. It'd be really interesting to interview, to ask them why. Um, probably A, it's convenient for Manchester, um, where a lot of them come from. B, it's very pretty. C, it's very accepting. That's my understanding. Very tolerant. They don't get hassled. And in fact, um, I think someone actually said that to a photographer who took pictures of them. We just we don't get hassled here. Um, uh, um, and D, there's a synagogue there. But the interesting thing is, and this would make us get a fun I mean, a study, is if one does study the Jewish press during the summer months, particularly in the past, pretty much all across the North Wales coast, as far as um, Hollyhead, there will be. Jews of all different persuasions on, on, on holiday, whether that's um, as part of an ultra-Orthodox community or doing some kind of summer camp. Um, North Wales is very popular for Jewish summer camps. And just to give you a bit of uh, some other travellers from the past, one of the sites that we feature and I, I, I talk about is Gurich Castle, um, which isn't in Chlandidna, but further along the coast uh, um, um, in, uh, towards Abigail. Um Gureth Castle played host to um, kin, um, a group of kinder transports um, in, in, from 1939 to 1941 um, on a program called Hachshara, which is um, um, uh, um, to prepare them for the kibbutz life in Israel. So in the past, before it became unpopular to do this, um, Israel, uh, where Israel was constantly compared to Wales. Uh, Israel, the country the size of Wales, um, but I find this an interesting parallel because clearly something about the North Wales um, uh, uh, landscape appealed because it became the training ground for sending Jews to um, Israel to work on a kibbutz. Um, clearly the weather, though, was not at all similar. Um, but maybe if you can survive the North Welsh weather in the uh, winter, you can survive <laughs> an Israeli summer. Who knows? But there's lots, there's lots to explore and extrapolate here. I, Think about this um, travellers theme. Okay, so um, for travellers to Wales, I, I also turn this into um, Voice Map, which is a free, open source platform um, where you you give them the information, they they do the rest, and this is an audio tour, so you can if one wants to go around the Flan did not plugged into your phone, and uh, listen to my dulcet tones tell you about the history of Flan did not, and I've given you the um, URL there. Um, there is a small charge for that because that's how their platform works. Um, so this is the way that we're trying to appeal to travellers to Wales to um, learn more about those people who have travelled to Wales and continue to travel to Wales. Um, just to sort of move towards the end, um, we are currently working on, and here's some images, a, um, as you can see there, Hannes Rydawan uh, uh, Ernest Morn, uh, A Jewish History of Anglesey. Um, because the, um, there was no community in Anglesey in, in one single place, you know, it's easy to Bangor, small place, Khandidna, Colwyn Bay, we hope to work on Hrill and then Wrexham if we get the money. Um, because there were, you know, there's the Jewish stories take place across the entire island, we, I doubt we'll do a walking tour of this unless people are very fit and have a lot of patience to walk from, uh, um, to walk across Menai Bridge to Bo Maris and then I don't even know what order we'd do it in because um, the sites on um, Rosnaiger, Amloch, Bo Maris, um, Nubra and, and, some, and a couple of others. So I uh, will print this map but I think what we'll, what we'll do is think of it as a driving tour and uh, maybe that might be interesting is to do a coach tour of these sites. So all of Anglesey is one map. Um, and just to give you one example of the detail from the map, here is the Polycos store in Hollyhead, the Golden Lock. Um, Polycos were unusual. Again, they were immigrants from Eastern Europe um, as part of that great wave of migration. And they opened their first store in Hollyhead and then branched out to Bangor and Pocheli. And if one goes to Pocheli um, today, one can see the name of Polycos um, uh, on the shop. And um, 
Polakoff's um, uh, um, the, the the they donated um, the old synagogue as well as some um, personal family effects to the museum in Bangor, which is well worth a visit anyway. But but for having these effects, and um, by the way, I should mention there's also um, um, an exhibition based on the material to do with Chandidna currently um, at the Chandidna Museum until just after um, I'll say Passover. Um, but, but for the benefit of the uh, non-Jewish celebrants among us, um, e just after Easter. Um, so in the top floor of the Chandidna Museum, they have an exhibition, um, our Jewish history of Chandidna, accompanied by, um, serendipitously or providentially, depending on how you look at it, a series of photographs taken by a lot of local photographer of Jewish visitors to Chandidna who went to the synagogue and photographed them. So, um, if, if you are up this way, I do recommend seeing that. So there we are. There's an overview of um, some of the Travellers to Wales that we've been mapping in our project that we hope that Travellers to Wales today will travel to undertake. So thank you very much. Yeah, Nathan, thank you very, very much indeed. And as I mentioned earlier, I was at Llandita Museum today. And they were telling um, us that you have an increasingly large number of people attend these walking tours. And yes, you do have one this Sunday. And so best of luck with that. And again, lots of rounds of applause is appearing on the screen. And again, please use the um, chat box for questions. And now we come to our last speaker of the evening, Croeso uh, Mauruan E. Katrin Stevens, a warm welcome now to Katrin Stevens. Katrin, over to you. Yeah. Hello. Um, I can't find my PowerPoint on my screen. James, can you help? Sorry, it isn't coming up here at all. Sorry, James, can you hear me? Yeah, Marin, uh, yeah, Catherine, I'm just going to share my screen Sorry, quickly. Because it's not, it's not yeah. coming up here at all. Sorry, we did a, a practice of this beforehand and it worked perfectly. But there we are. Just going to share my screen, okay? And if you let me know when you want to change the, the slide. All right, okay. Okay. There we go. You have the full screen as well? Yep. Yeah. A few seconds. Okay, I'm seeing the size on the side at the moment. Yep. There we go. Two seconds. Okay. I can see the size on the side still. Can we make it into full, full screen? Should. Two seconds. Anyway, I'll, I'll start and we can carry on from there. Diolch am awr iawn. Am y cyfreid o dwi i sôn am deithiau cerdded uh, Trift Hadaith Mynawod, Archid Mynawod Cymru. Thank you very much for the invitation from Llafia uh, to introduce the Women's Heritage Walks produced by Archid Mynawod Cymru Women's Archive Wales in 2020-21. Our aims as an archive are to raise the profile of women in the history of Wales and to safeguard the sources of that history, because without sources, there is no history, obviously. But before I launch into this topic, I thought I could explain what the archive has been doing during the last 10 years, some of the other projects very quickly. So if you can go to slide two, James. Okay. I, I can't see them, you see. I'm not coming up on my computer, sorry. Does that work? Is that working for you? That's better, yeah, that's fine. Yeah? Thank you, yeah. Okay. So these are some of the projects we've been doing very quickly uh, during the last oh, 10 years really now almost. Uh, we did a Voices from the Factory Floor project, uh, recording 200 oral histories of women who'd worked in factories around Wales between uh, 1945 and 1975. Then we went on to look at women in World War I because we were concerned that uh, perhaps the, the male element of society was having more attention. And nowadays we have about 500 entries on the project, 
website. Then in, 19, uh, in 2018, we celebrated the fact that women, uh, some women anyway, had won the vote in the Century of Hope project, a complicated project um, that had 12 events around Wales as part of it. And before we finished that, we started on another one, uh, sponsored as well, not only by the Heritage Lottery Fund, who sponsored all the other projects here, uh, but by the Welsh Assembly or the Senate, uh, in which we uh, interviewed former and current AMs or LSs and, safe, and got them to safeguard their political papers because we were concerned that they weren't doing so. And uh, during the last uh, year or two, we've been uh, looking at the Women's Peace Petition of 1923-24. So there are plenty of things that we're getting on with, and we have uh, an annual conference and a newsletter, etc. as well, quite a busy uh, volunteer group. But as chair, when the lockdown uh, occurred in 2020, I was very concerned that we would lose touch with our ordinary members and the task of engaging the public in women's history would lose its momentum. This is where the women's heritage walks proved so significant. Next um, slide, please. Now we can't claim that this is a new idea or our own original idea. Glasgow Women's Library, for example, has developed six walks around the city. And here in Wales, well, in 2013, uh, the Barry Women's Trail had been established to celebrate International Women's Day. A year later, there was a Penarth Women's Trail, um, and that they're both on the Bain of Glamorgan uh, website today. And then uh, in 2014 as well, a group of us came together in Swansea uh, with Jazz Heritage Wales, the archive and um, open house. And we prepared a booklet on women, on the eminent women of Swansea around the city centre. And then as part of the Century of Hope project I mentioned just now, um, the event we organised in Aberystwyth was a women's heritage walk. And this, uh, and there was also an app to go with this. And this took, took place in June 2018. Next slide. These then were the foundations uh, that Women's Archive Wales built upon for the project in 2020-2021, with the added ambition of making this an all, all Wales experience of walks written by our own members in their own localities and delivered as booklets and actual walks in the summer and autumn of 2021. And you can see there we've got one for Wrexham, Llandidno, Bangor, Aberystwyth, Arbert, Camarden, Swansea, Pontypridd, Abergavenny, uh, Cardiff, Penarth and Barry. So by the date of the official launch of this project in April 2021, we had 11 walks ready. We also, next slide please, we also decided to print booklets to go with these walks and they're in a uniform format, more or less anyway, A5 and bilingual. They're all printed locally in their own areas. We were fortunate indeed in some cases uh, that county and other, uh, and other archives and museums also worked with us. For example, the archives and special collections of Bangor and Cardiff universities, Narberth and Llandidno Museum, and Camarden Civic uh, Society. The one on the left there is the one from Upper Bangor, uh, and they decided to call it Women of Substance. Indeed, the top, lady right at the top in the, on the right-hand corner is Lady Wartsky, which is uh, links in with Nathan's talk very well. Then we have people like Mary Celine Roberts, the educationalist, and um, Charlotte Price White, the suffragist and peace campaigner. So uh, they were indeed women of substance. The second one you see there is the Camarden uh, walk, where we have suffragette Rachel Barrett and also the suffragist and Anita Alice Aberdeen. So a variety of women. And then on the right is the sort of reconfigured Penarth booklet that we wrote uh, with Mary Mackenzie, the educationist in it, Summer Kathleen Thomas, and then uh, various other authors, etc. So a variety. And these engage the support of local uh, uh, Women's Archive Wales members. We enabled and enthused them to choose whom they wanted to include themselves, we didn't direct them in any way, and whom they felt were of interest to their own public in their own area. Each walk focuses upon 10 women or groups of women, thus highlighting altogether with 
Now we have 12, 13 booklets, in fact, so 130 women. Some of these are well known, perhaps, but also some, many of them are forgotten and neglected by historians. I've chosen just um, seven of the walks to give you some flavour of the contents. Uh, the text in each case is just meant to be an introduction. It's not meant to be a full biographical entry. So if we start then with the first one. Um, so this is the Pontypridd Heritage Walk uh, by Dr. Chris Chapman and Dr. Ellen Jones. And they chose, amongst others, uh, to focus upon Elaine Morgan, author, feminist, and innovative, innovative scientist. And there will be a, pla uh, a statue um, unveiled to Elaine Morgan in Montenash or Aberpenna, uh, I think is next week. So she has had a great deal of attention, but certainly deserves it. So can we just see the, the extract on Elaine Morgan? Yeah, this is how it would appear in the booklet. Not quite like this, it's a little bit of a different format, but for a PowerPoint. Um, it mentions a little bit of her writing of the plays she wrote, the awards she won, um, the feminist evolution theory she presented in the De Descent of Women, and also, of course, her degrees and all her contribution as well as a weekly columnist in the Western Main. So a very notable woman uh, in her own right and a remarkable career. If you go to the next one now, um, well, the Barry Heritage Walk was reconfigured by Dr. Sean Vianon Williams, and she chose to feature Annie Gwenllian Jones. So if you go on to that, please. Um, Annie Gwenllian, you may be familiar with her as uh, the one who spent years, three years in Yuzovska in the Ukraine as a governess, which is poignant today. But then um, Shandri Anon has decided to focus especially on her contribution to, um, to uh, uh, Barry itself. As a founder member of the Barry Camradorian Society, secretary of the Barry branch of Cardiff and District's Women's Suffrage Society, president of the local British Women's Temperance Society, and supporting the Red Cross and Belgian refugees. And she, uh, later on in her career, she was a chair of the YMCA canteen during the Second World War and a member of the South Wales Conscientious Objectors Tribunal. And her talks of, on her experiences in the Ukraine were, um, were broadcast by the BBC. And I think those will be really worth unearthing today to hear those then. So, um, you know, Sean has focused upon her very considerable contribution to the civic life uh, in Barry itself and beyond as well. If you go on then, then please. Um, the Abergavenny Heritage Walk, and this is just one woman out of the 10 women featured in that, written by Carolyn Pekler, features Ethel Lena White, completely unfamiliar name to me uh, when, I, when we started on this, uh, but Carolyn was able to unearth her story. Can we look at the, that then? So Ethel Lena White was, really a very, very well-known crime fiction writer in Britain and America in the 30s and 40s. Um, you know, she ranked up there with Dorothy L. Sayers and Agatha Christie. And her main, perhaps she's well-known today maybe because her book, The Wheel Spins, was filmed in 1936 by Alfred Hitchcock in the film, The Lady Vanishes. Two of her other novels were also turned into film, but someone which has disappeared really from our own history here in Wales to a great extent, um, and certainly um, you know, needed to be revived then, the story needed to be revived in Abergavenny. Onwards then, please. Quickly to the Wrexham Heritage Walk, written by Georgina Gittings, a, a member of the archive. And she, one of the women she chose to focus upon was Jane Morgan, uh, the a researcher and historian. Again, a name that has slipped out of our memories, I think. This is the um, introduction to her in the leaflet. You can see here how the leaflets are bilingual, um, but she talks about her contribution, really her research. Um, she looked at the, the, um, uh, the influence of central government on local police forces during the major labor disputes of 1900, 1939. And she also worked on, in the Center for Criminology Research at Oxford University. Um, and her work, you know, has received a lot of acclaim for its very rare humanizing touch and influence on government policy. 
again someone who really deserves to be brought back into our in, into our um, uh, information and knowledge about women's history again. Um, a very different woman featured in the Narberth Heritage Walk, written by Emma Baines of Narberth Museum. We're very glad that she helped us with this because she chose to feature Annie Webb. And if we can go to the next slide. Uh, Annie Webb was um, born in Monmouth but lived in Narberth for most of her life. Um, she was an independent uh, character, self motivated. She built her own home out of her own bricks. And I think that a uh, lovely evocative photograph of her seems to suggest uh, that as the local press claimed, she was a headstrong character. I don't know whether they'd say that about a man, but she was certainly somebody, somebody worth remembering, especially in the Narberth area, because her home is still there. And you can go and see it then, uh, Peter's Lake in Narberth. So uh, again, somebody very different woman then from Elaine Morgan, who was featured in the Pontypridd War. And then the last two I'm featuring in this particular talk is from Llandidno uh, Museum and Gallery, written by Dr. Diane Bell, Llandidno having a lot of attention tonight, and she focused on somebody completely different. So if we go to the next slide, she chose to look at Lodwen, uh, who lived around 3510 BC and was discovered, her skeleton was discovered on the Little Orm in 1891. And um, she, fascinatingly, uh, archaeologists have shown that the degenerative arthritis in the spine and her knee indicates a physically arduous lifestyle of carrying heavy loads on her head and extended arms. I think it was delightful, really, that we were able to reach back into prehistory in this war and booklet. And then uh, Swansea, many of the women have to say in these Walks. It was a group of us working on this in Swansea, um, feature very worthy women who've done very well educationally and have taken all the advantages they, they could to, um, to advance themselves, fair, fair enough. But we in Swansea, one of our women, uh, well, one of our um, stops on the walk is at Swansea Prison, just before looking at the Swansea Prison from outside, thankfully. Um, and one of our um, writers, Elizabeth Beltram, is an expert on Swansea's bad girls. So we look forward. Look forward to the next slide. Uh, such as Lily Argent here, a photograph taken of this poor girl in uh, 1905. Um, it, she talks about really uh, these as victims of drink, prostitution, and general poverty. And as she says at the end of her entry, they all struggled for survival. Each woman's story has pathos. The streets were their domain. Each served time in Swansea Prison. Well, those seven extracts, I hope, will give you some idea of the immense goodwill and hard work of individual and group members of the archive, what they did last year. I focused on seven women or groups of women out of a total of 130. Since then, we've added two new booklets to our tally, and I'd like to just show you um, some of these as well. Uh, this is the one that's just been written by Sarah Hughes of the Cardiff University Specials Collection and Archives in partnership with us. And this is a, 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 the sculpture, a sculpture by Barbara Hepworth. Um, it is outside the, um, the music building, music department in Swansea, in Cardiff, sorry. I've walked along there several times, very familiar with the campus, but I've never noticed it. But uh, on Tuesday, we walked this walk, and uh, we walked also through the Civic Centre, talking about another nine uh, important women in this area. So um, it was a revelation to me to learn about the fact that there was a Barbara Hepworth sculpture in Swansea. And then the last one that we've um, just had written now, recently, very recently, is written by Swansea, uh, Sylvia Mason and Rebecca Eversley Dawes. Of, um, uh, of, of Newport, you know, it was really important that we had a walk for Newport as the third largest um, city in Wales. Um, these, this walk features Emily Eversley and Isilda Richard, both members of the Windrush generation, and they settled in, in Newport. This giving us, I think, a new focus and an important uh, other focus in women's history in Wales. 
But of course, the work isn't finished. So let me go forward one. Um, there is a, a leaflet and a walk being prepared now from Merthyr. And that's important as well, because there's so much rich history in, in Merthyr and a women's history as well. Um, and uh, we hopefully will have one for Butte Town in Cardiff in the not too distant future. But there's lots of other areas where we could have walks. Uh, Llanelli, for example, we haven't got one for Anglesey at all, Brecon, Aberdeer, Halford West, Carnarvon, etc., etc. And if anyone here, male or female, would like would be interested in helping with these booklets and writing such a walk, then please do so. And just to show that we just don't talk about things and write about them, we also walk the walk. And this was this was uh, these are pictures taken last summer. Uh, we did have some fine days and COVID restrictions did allow us out to walk and it was very, uh, very pleasant to do so after being cooked in for so long. Uh, here we see the Penarth walk, the first one, then over to Aberystwyth. Um, down on the left on the bottom is the Barry walk, all very carefully socially distanced. And uh, we did have some rain last summer and the Bangor walk fell. Uh, caught themselves in a real storm, I think, uh, when they went out, but you some, recognize some faces there, I'm sure. So um, that, that's great to have people walking these walk when we intend revisiting these next summer. Um, so I think they have made a contribution to the history of women in Wales. They brought some really uh, fascinating women to the foreground once more and given people a chance to learn about them. They are on our website. You can read and download them and please promote them and even venture out to walk them yourselves. Uh, as I say, we intend uh, organising more walks uh, this summer. So that's it. That's the, um, those are the Women's Heritage Walks in Wales. Thank you very much. You gave us such a wonderful overview. I've been aware of the walks for some time. And it's been fascinating for me to learn the background of the way that you've approached bringing them together. What I particularly enjoy about them is the variety of women, the different periods. And it's, um, I'm, I'm delighted to see that you're now looking into diversity as, as well. So I look forward to seeing how these walks develop. And a huge thanks to all our speakers. Now we're coming to a few weeks. We overrun slightly, but I think that's absolutely fine. The talks have been fascinating and given us such a broad view of how we can look at Wales as we travel through it or all live in it. Now, um, the, um, the speakers have made my life as chair when it comes to Q&A very, very easy because they've already been answering the questions in the chat as they've been going along. So thank you very much indeed. For some of you who haven't been keeping an eye on the on the chat. I'll just go over a few of the questions in case you've missed them. There was a very interesting chat going on between Rita and Monica Kendall about the money um, behind George Hay Dawkins' pennant, and you may wish to follow that, that debate there. And some very interesting debates going on as well um, with Nathan regarding the uh, the Jewish heritage of Wales. Uh, that personal question for Nathan: um, Did you pick up that big um, Polakoff sign from Hollyhead? I gave um, you the nod. No, um, I I don't know what happened with that. Um, uh, I didn't that was pre-COVID, wasn't it? Yes. I have um, no. Who would? Um, that's fine. Do you want, I can put you back in touch with the bloke who's, who's got it. No, no problem. Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. Because, yeah. I mean, I think one of the things yeah. we'd like to do That's is have right. We closed exhibition. down. We were locked down immediately after that, weren't we? Yes, yes. Yeah, you're, you're thanks right. for jogging my memory. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. And it's very interesting, some of the points that came up there. Um, Anglesey Max Horton on Anglesey. And this is from um, GE Ansel um, Brownen. And... Um, they write, Jewish war heroes' heritage is finally set in stone. Military historians have described him as perhaps the greatest fighting admiral um, produced in great, by, by Great Britain in the 20th century and one of the most important allied commanders in the entire Second World War. But today, very few know his name, absolutely. Do check out um, all the links that people have been putting in the chat because they do um, take you to some very interesting points. Now, a question here from Becky. 
who raises, where can she find more information about North Wales being a preparation for the kibbutz? Um, well, Kai's book should have um, details on that. And I did pop into the chat a link um, about a little article I wrote about Gurukh Castle. So yeah. um, you can follow that for a bit of information. I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, actually, it's one of Rita's colleagues in Aberystwyth with um, Andrea Hamill, who's been working on um, kinder transport. So um, I'm sure Andrea will know more about, about those. Um, but I, I'd have to look it up. But I don't think a specific study has been done on this in as much as not much study has been done on any of this other than what Kai's done. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And some very interesting points have come up as well about the Jewish um, presence around the rest of Wales as, as well. And moving on, uh, very interesting, um, uh, Teorki on the 6th of March 1939 in conjunction with Burberry, founded by Thomas Burberry. So again, some very interesting. And Darren comes out with a very interesting point about Elaine's more, uh, Elaine Morgan statue, which will be unveiled um, on the 18th of this month, Darren. Excellent, at Tikalon Lan uh, Medical Centre. And Becky, thank you. I, I found this comment very interesting. My great grandmother married out, as did her siblings, second generation in Liverpool. My grand moved to Colwyn Bay in the, seven, in the 1970s. All those summer holidays to call in, that's wonderful, yes. Thank you for the link introducing me to this history. And that's why walks and apps and presentations like this can be so interesting, because they can retouch second, third, fourth generation people who've lived in Wales for quite some time with their broader heritage. Um, so it's not only useful for educating um, um, the um, Welsh Indigenous people of Wales. And we have a question for Nathan from Rita. Are the, is it Schwabes, Schwabe, how do you pronounce it, featuring in your Anglesey tour? And apologies for my appalling pro, um, pronunciation there. <laughs> Thank you, Rita. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you must go. Yes, yes, I forgot to. Um, so interestingly, ours is prevent, um, uh, uh, provides a bridge between the, the two projects either side. Um, I, I downloaded them and had a look at your maps as you, um, and the, the, the women's archives maps and there's this with this Winifred Bortsky um, obviously and we we have Derwin Degg on on our, on our walk mm -hmm. and um, Glyn Garth is on our um, Anglesey walk because of their Jewish heritage um, so so yeah that's a nice little overlap um, what would be fantastic if I know and, and Carol's Tully's up for it if I do recommend having a look at the link that, that Rita posted I really like that they've done a tube style map of the different routes across North Wales. It's fantastic. Very simple. I love that. I mean, I'm a Londoner, so I love the tube map. Um, and I would love to, because we have all these different projects, but they overlap to have a hub. Um, so, so, you know, I don't have a website like the Women's Archive Wales, um, but, but one place we could go to, so one can see the intersections. Um, and there's a great project called Layers of London um, I don't know if you want to Google that, and that would be really good because what you do is you go on a site and it shows the different layers of history. It'd be, it'd be a great way to find a way to pull this all together so you can find the intersecting points of interest, like Winifred Wartsky for for uh, you know for my um, and 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 um, the the Schwabers uh, as examples. Thank you very much. In relation to what you were saying about the multi-level map there, and are you familiar with some of the deep map mapping projects that are taking place at the moment? It sounds as if that might be a useful flat platform um, to do them. And a message from Kim Colebrook here, why not put them on the People's Collection? People's Collection Wales is of course a very useful and free site for loading um, anything to do with the heritage of Wales. And a, um, a thank you here for Catherine from, from Hugh Davis who is very grateful to Catherine for mentioning Jane Jones, one of the, the naughty girls, the bad girls, because it's really interesting to have um, women who have been perceived to fall outside of the law recognised. Um, and perhaps we can learn to understand some of the reasons why they, they um, uh, were either forced or chose the lifestyles that they did. And a question here from Becky, will I be able to access the recording of this event? 
Um, I think she mentioned earlier that she was late in arriving. Uh, Darren is nodding yes. Um, and um, Sabir um, usually uploads all the recordings of its talks. Um, Rita has a comment here from Rita. European Travellers is on the People's Collection Wales website. We copied our overview from the journey of the past and created some collections now and a link there. Any other points or questions for our for our speakers? Right. Well, could we please, could we please unmute our mics and please just give a round of applause to our speakers. We've had an exceptionally informative evening tonight. The quality of, of the work and also the, the presentations where you've been, you've been able to explain very complex issues, you know, in ways that we can all understand. Thank you very much indeed. Aaron, over to you. Well, that's a shock. I, I thought you was closing, closing things up, Mary. <laughs> I'm in me, Jim. You can take it as a close if you want. It's up to you, Darren. <laughs> I, it just, just the thing, I, you know, echo what you said. I, th I thought it was fantastic. Three brilliant talks. I was really particularly impressed how things overlapped and how, how much you know, work is going on in different different parts of Wales, which 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 uh, get, can can join and, and can come together. Just from a personal note, with, with my other hat on, my work hat on, cat and anything we can, RCT Heritage can do to support what you're doing. We, you know, we're 100 behind that and I'd be keen to work with you on anything. But thanks everybody for coming. Uh, thanks, thanks for the questions. I thought there's some brilliant questions in there, and I always like a bit of debate as well, which is always always the cut and thrust. So fantastic and. Hope to see you all in, in the next session. So thank you all for coming and see you all soon.